If you happen to be listening to this podcast and you are in the United States, like I am, we often, and I mean often, take our freedoms and liberties for granted. I know just walking through the airport, walking down the street, (laughs) down the city street, I feel safe. And one of the reasons that I feel safe, and I don't even know it, is because of all the working dogs that are out there doing their jobs, making where we live, where we travel, where we spend our lives safer places. And something I learned about our working dogs from our guest on today's episode is that when these working dogs are injured or retired, there are no plans in place for them. And to me, that's incredibly disheartening. I know I am all riled up after today's episode with what can I do? What can I do contacting my local representatives, contacting whoever I can, and of course, donating to these causes that are helping our working dogs like Mission Canine Rescue. So what you're going to learn on today's episode is what Mission Canine Rescue is, why they are so necessary, what dogs are they helping, and how you can help too. This is a topic that I was actually not very aware of until I talked to Bob Bryant from Mission Canine Rescue, and I bet you're not very aware of it either, but that is why today's episode is so incredibly powerful. Make sure you stick around to the end in case you are one of those people who finds themselves in a really great situation to be able to adopt one of these working dogs who needs you so badly. So without any further ado, here's Bob Bryant from Mission Canine Rescue. Have you tried training methods that just didn't work? Do you feel that your pet is not getting his or her nutritional needs met? Are illnesses and bad behavior your daily norm? You're going to want to join me on the Pet Parenting Reset, where you'll hear interesting and informative interviews and get solutions to all your pet problems. I'm your host, Jessica L. Fisher. Well, hi, Bob. Thank you so much for joining me today. I'm so excited to have you here to talk about Mission Canine. Can you tell me a little bit more about Mission Canine Rescue and just let the people listening know what it's all about and what you do? I'll give you the two-minute elevator speech. Okay. (laughs) Mission Canine Rescue is a United States, excuse me, United States-based 501c3 nonprofit we're located out of Houston, Texas. We've been in operation now for approximately 10 years. Uh, we do close to $2 million worth of work a year at a 92% spend of every dollar toward our work. So we truly are very little, if anything, left over in the realms of profit. Um, since 2013, uh, we have rescued military working dogs, contract working dogs, uh, customs and border patrol dogs, TSA dogs, and police canines, and some other interesting uh, work breeds that actually, uh, they search citrus orchards for diseased trees. They run in the trees and they will alert, uh, and uh, they retire those dogs too. So we brought home over 1,200 and 50 dogs over the last 10 years, and of those, 640 or 50 have been reunited with handlers that they formerly served with. Well, that's awesome. That's actually one of the questions I had, because I know a lot of social media posts I see about working dogs, whether it's a police dog or a military dog, their handler, the, the, the handler that they have, because sometimes they have multiple handlers, when they're retiring or maybe if they're injured and they have to retire because of that, that that handler generally, I, what I see wants to keep them. (laughs) Um, so I'm sure there's some hoops you have to go through to do that, but, um, I'm glad to hear that some of them do get to stay with their handlers. Well, actually, uh, the military 
Uh, a working dog in the military can have up to five handlers in its career. And the military decides through their own combination, who knows how they do it, of what handler is going to get to retire with the dog. Normally, it's the handler that spent the most amount of time with the working dog. And, uh, but there are occasions where a handler might have young children, could be a very high drive uh, dog trained in patrol, a lot of bike training, you know, it's a bad situation. And in many cases, those handlers will let another handler take the dog and then they'll come and visit. So it's pretty cool. So when you're talking about working dogs, just so our listeners understand um, the difference, because there are like these dogs, well, first of all, we all know dogs are absolutely incredible. So they kind of run the gamut of things they do all from, you know, there are dogs that are, you know, therapy dogs that go into nursing homes and hospitals and schools and all the way up to like our military working dogs and our police dogs who are doing some incredibly courageous <laughs> things. Um, so you, you tend to work more with the, the dogs that are, like you said, in the military police, uh, as you were saying, and they, they sniff out, um, uh, disease in, in citrus trees. So these, these dogs are a little bit different from like the average, you know, therapy working dog <laughs> that we think of, That's right? True. These dogs, um, literally train like athletes all their lives. Uh, they have a drive to work. That's just incredible. And, uh, you're very fortunate to be able to see one in action. Uh, they're able to do just amazing things with their nose, and that drive doesn't go away when they retire. They still have it. They still want to find things. Uh, I have a crazy German Shepherd that's been retired for three years now, and he likes nothing better than finding tennis balls and occasionally marijuana and methamphetamine in our local parks. That's uh, that's always a thrill. <laughs> I bet that is <laughs> a little bit more than a thrill. Um, <laughs> So <laughs> when I think of our working dogs, you know, I, I have not been in that area of rescue work that, that you're in. So I personally need a little education and I'm sure our listeners do too. I know the, like the therapy type working dogs, I have had some instances being able to work with from a, a, a health coaching perspective, because even in these cases of, you know, therapy dogs in a school, you know, that seems like a really benign kind of easy going job for a dog, but in all reality, it is actually very stressful for them. Um, and they generally do need quite a bit of work outside of their job, their, you know, therapy job. So, I noticed that you, the Mission Canine Rescue does a lot of rehabilitation for these dogs as well. Can you talk about that a little bit? Sure. A lot of the times, dogs that come back will have literally PTSD from the environments they've been around, whether it's explosions or just rough handling in the case of contract working dogs by foreign nationals. They tend to be only concerned with the results and they don't really care about how the dogs are treated. That's not the same with our military dogs. Uh, they get Cadillac treatment, although I know a few handlers that have rocks in their heads. <laughs> so it, it happens in all areas. So when we get these dogs back, we see a variety of issues. Some are ready to place in loving homes in a week's time. Others we may have over a year. Um, we see a lot of aggression toward other dogs. Uh, that's the main thing that we notice is that uh, most working dogs were never socialized with other, with other dogs. They didn't get that playtime that they normally have. And as a result, uh, they don't uh, tend to get along with the other dogs because they haven't had socialization, especially males before they're neutered. They literally hate the other males. Uh, we will see in occasion, on occasion, some, I don't want to call it, uh, it's a fear reaction to loud noises. And that's basically due to explosives in their, you know, confines in their, in their area of work during their career. We'll see them shrink back. We'll see them cower. 
because they don't like the effects of those type of noises. So what we try to do is condition them with love over time. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Whether it's working in with another dog to see if they can become dog friendly or uh, dealing with, say, for instance, uh, uh, fence aggression, crate aggression. You can walk up to some crates. You'll think the dog wants to eat you alive, yet it's just a barrier and he's defending his barrier. You open the door and it's all friendly love and cuddles. So we see that. We see a lot of medical problems uh, coming in, not from the military dogs. They get good vet care, but with contract working dogs, uh, because they don't get routine vet care in most cases, you never know what you're going to get. So we deal with cancers, we deal with heartworms all the time. We have a lot higher incidence of dogs with PTSD that were contract working dogs that were mistreated. And so we teach them that people aren't awful, that with love, all things are possible. And some dogs uh, respond to it very well. We even uh, teach them how to live in a house, live around other people, uh, get treats. You know, we ha each one of them has an individual large play yard. We're talking 100 by 250 that they can enjoy. And so they're not kenneled all the time when they're with us. Uh, basically, we try to teach them how to be dogs again. Yeah, so what I'm understanding is that we have some really incredible dogs who are trained to do some really incredible things, and then there are no plans in place for when their job is done. Is that right? That's why That's right. Mission Canine Rescue... That's why we're here. Is here. Well, the happiest, happiest day of my life will be the day we're not needed anymore. When every dog gets a early retirement, where they get a trip home, where they get good vet care, where they have a loving home to come home to. But unfortunately, I don't see that playing out anytime soon. Uh, there's just too many people that want to profit off the dogs, yet they don't regard the dogs as equal to humans in a uh, team concept. Is that also true in, in military? Because I know, I remember uh, President Obama, I think it was, uh, reclassified military working dogs from equipment because they used to be equipment. Is that right? Actually, you got your homework down pretty good. That was, <laughs> a, that was a provision in the 2016 National Defense Authorization Act that Obama signed and it, it what, what the main gist of it was that dogs were no longer to be left overseas when retired they were to be brought to the continental united states now here's what you don't know the military got around that by calling its operating bases overseas united states soil because they considered it <clears throat> to be united states now i'm happy to say that as of this year we now have much more cooperation with the military and they're putting more dogs on rotator flights that are coming from different places. And we're not having to bear as many $6,000 tri trips from Guam or Japan or Korea and a lot of, you know, stress on the dogs. Uh, they can fly home with other military members, but still some of them do require uh, our intervention overseas. And when they get here, uh, we still have to, bring them to wherever their final destination is. So there in, I've heard you mention it a couple of times. There is a difference in a contractor working dog and a military working dog. And you've mentioned the difference in treatment. Are there any other differences we should know about? Ownership. First of okay. all, to make, to make it clear, <clears throat> MWD, military working dog owned by the military, bred by the military, trained by the military, not used by anybody but the military. Contract working dog, CWD, private company, goes after contracts all over the world, handled mostly by foreign nationals, except some of our American contract companies work their dogs directly, like AMK9, they're very good. Uh, they're a good contractor. There's much, there's many more bad contractors <clears throat> excuse me, than good contractors. And we try to 
help the bad contractors get their dogs to safety. And then, well, we kind of hope that they decide that the dog business is not for them. Right. We try to help them out. So they go after contracts much in the same way that, you know. For instance, uh, guarding, uh, we got a bunch of dogs back from Kuwait recently. Their job was uh, they were in custom stations. They were sniffing for explosives for drugs. And we have some come from North Africa. These dogs were used for demining. They worked all day on 12 by 12 squares looking for landmines. Wow. That's incredibly dangerous. <laughs> yeah, it is. So these dogs, some of them obviously will be injured uh, during their, you know, whatever duty they're doing, whatever work they're doing. Is that something that, again, the military is better at taking care of these dogs that are injured and not so much with these contractors? Or is it similar with both? Military dogs are always going to get competent veterinary care when they have an injury. And they're going to see that through. Uh, the contractors may just put a Band-Aid on it and forget about it. Or they may kennel the dog and forget about the dog. That's the difference. They don't. Or they'll want to retire the dog and they'll call us and not bother to tell us the dog's hip is broken. Okay. We see a lot of that. We see a lot yeah. of that come through and it's very sad. But... Yeah. We take care of that dog. We fix that broken hip. We raise the several thousand dollars it costs to get it done. Yeah, absolutely. That is an important thing that they should be telling you, right? Exactly. <laughs> so it doesn't sound like it's very easy to actually rescue one of these dogs from overseas. Um, even if it is, um, well, even the military dogs, it sounds like it's getting it, a little bit easier because they're this year they're 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 bringing more of them back home to the United States to what we know as the United States. <laughs> um, but it's not super easy. And I I would imagine are there other organizations like Mission Canine Rescue who are out there trying to help these dogs? We are the largest of the organizations that does this. There are a couple of small ones that take a few dogs here and there. We have a good counterpart called Hero Paws in the United Kingdom. Uh, we work with them. They adopt their UK dogs out over there. We've been helped them. We've had a couple uh, of adoptions over here, uh, very interesting folks. But there is a, a local, another small rescue operates out of uh, Pennsylvania that uh, takes in some contract dogs. And do you think do you think there there is room that we need more organizations like Mission Canine, or we need to help Mission Canine to expand? Are there like a lot of dogs that are not receiving this type of care, rehabilitation, rehoming? I don't, I don't, I don't want to pretend to tell you that we're the only one that knows about this work, but I will tell you that we are probably the most qualified in doing this work from our leadership. I mean, we have handlers and veterinary techs in leadership positions that have worked with these dogs now for 13 plus years. Uh, we need to grow. We need to be able to extend our capacity to handle more dogs because when you get a level of success in your work, people seek you out and they want to give you more dogs. Mm -hmm. um, we have a lot of police departments reaching out to get rid of problem dogs. And what I'm trying to convince these police departments is have a plan in place for the care of your problem dogs if you get one. If you can't adopt it, you know, we can't take a dog that's got five bites on its record and confidently adopt that dog out. It would be a liability risk. And so, you know, what happens to those otherwise good dogs that have had poor training? We want the local governments to provide for their needs whenever possible. But uh, it's, I would say every other day we have someone wanting us to take a dog. So it never stops. The only thing that forces our hand is our capacity at the time. So and now I'm generally not one for big government, but unfortunately it sounds like forcing people to take responsibility for uh 
what what they have the you know these dogs are sentient beings and they they um, matter <laughs> you know they they're living breathing breathing beings um, and to take responsibility for them unfortunately it sounds like the uh, legislation around the um, being able to have these dogs and use these dogs needs some reform. I mentioned this to nearly everybody that I've spoken to <laughs> online is that I'm also a limited government guy. Keep your hand out of my pocket. You know, don't tell me what to do. I'm not going to break any laws. I'm a good boy. Stay away. But with the contract dogs, they don't have a voice. And I'd very much like to see everybody writing their representative saying, hey, contract working dogs being worked anywhere in the world need a ticket home and they need veterinary care funding and proper nutrition while they're working. And it seems like that provide, should be a... Yeah, you don't put it up, you don't take the dogs. Period. Yeah, it seems like that should be a... a, a qualification of the like part built into every contract right <laughs> like that should it be should, but it's part of it's it that, but it's, it's not we've and because it's not we've gotten dogs back that should weigh 70 pounds and weigh 35 because they take them out of service and they quit feeding them oh my gracious this is, this is contractors and again not all contractors are bad please don't get that idea unfortunately though we work with the bad ones because we want to save the dogs Right. So military dogs are just icing on the cake. Okay. That makes, that makes sense and puts it into perspective, I think for a lot of people. Um, so the, the whole goal is obviously to get these animals, to get these dogs, the care they need to rehabilitate them, hopefully to where they can live in a home and, and to have them placed in a home is, is, do I understand that right? Dogs into in, uh, environments and homes that are suited for their nature. And what I want people to know about that, if I can just expand on it, we want adopters that can afford the cost of veterinary care. If you don't want to take the dog to the vet, if you can't afford it, please don't apply to adopt. These senior dogs cost a lot of money to have, and they, and they need care. Also, if you've got four dogs in your household or two or three, maybe think twice about applying because it's going to be a long time with a dog that uh, may or may not be reactive to one of your pets. And also, if you work all the time, if you're not home, if you don't have time during the day to stimulate that dog, please get a lazy dog that wants to sleep on the couch. A Belgian Malinois will eat your house if it's bored. So let's don't, we don't want to contribute to boredom and I'll see. Yeah, these are definitely very special dogs, so we need special homes for them. Um, so when you do bring these dogs back home to the U.S., is are, do you have a foster network? How does that how does that work? The rehabilitation no, process. We, we will foster some dogs that require specific medical treatments, say heartworm treatments. They really need foster care. We have some good people we count on that will do that, and we're always interested in people close enough to that we can touch that can take care of that. For normal dogs, though, we don't do foster care because we need to know the nature of the dog, and we need to put it through our rehab process, and fosters just aren't in a position to do, to do that. So is it the... Um... So you have a facility, is that? Yes, yes. We okay. have a five-acre acre facility in Magnolia, Texas. We call the Veteran Canine Ranch. We house around 60 dogs there. We have a uh, kennel tech and um, kennel master and also a veterinary technician on site, as well as a team of good kennel techs that take care of the dogs, stimulate them, play with them. And uh, that way we get to know their nature. We don't have to second guess it. Okay. So it sounds like in addition to, you know, people like me who are putting the word out there and letting people know about your organization and know what's going on. And in addition to 
contacting our representatives, our local representatives, and and letting them know that we care about this issue and that we as a government do need to do more to protect our working dogs, regardless of whether they are military working dogs or contractor working dogs. Mission Canine Rescue specifically is in need of what funds and adopters, anything Everybody, else? Everybody, <laughs> the, nat- the nature of a nonprofit organization is to do this, stick their hand out and ask for money. We try to do right by our donors. Uh, I have many donors tell me if I had known how much help was really needed, I would have given more. They just didn't realize what we go through with these dogs. And while we're not all about money, it takes money to run the train. Uh, None of us travels first class. None of us stays in fancy hotels. Uh, We don't sit in leather chairs. My two partners, two very uh, fabulous females, uh, Kristen and Louisa, they run the roads with these dogs. They drive these dogs in vans all over the country. They sleep in roadside parks, and they love what they do. And I have to remind them, you got to slow down. you got to take some time for you because they literally work themselves to death as a result. But with, with more funding, we will be able to accommodate more dogs and get more dogs out of bad situations. And we're not the type of organization that constantly begs for money in every post. We'll tell you how you can give at every post, but it's not going to be some emotional, oh, here's poor Benji. He's going to die if he doesn't get surgery posts. But I'll tell you what, when we need money, and I'm about to do a fundraiser for medical bills, we've spent over $50,000 so far just in this new year since January 1st on necessary veterinary care, and we need to replace those funds so we can keep paying it forward. And also we have some military dogs coming home from Korea. Uh, We've got one that needs to go to Spain to its handler. Uh, None of this stuff is free. So, yes, uh, funding is always uh, a good thing. And just people sharing who we are and what we do is awesome, and we appreciate that. Of course. Yeah, that's so important because, you know, the more people that know about you, the more opportunity that you do have for people to donate um, because it is so important. And is there anywhere on the website where are there, you know, maybe uh, templated emails that people can use to contact their local representatives? There are not, but that's not a bad idea. And I could certainly consider doing that. We've had people just kind of do it on their own, but uh, I, yeah, tell you what, that's not a bad idea. I'll put some language together and make that available. Yeah. Cause I know that I am one of those people that will not hesitate to contact my local representative for something that is important and meaningful to me and um, having the right verbiage to do so versus just shooting off an email saying, this is important to me and you need to do something about it, (laughs) you know, can be very helpful. And the reality is that we do pay a lot of taxes to our federal government and making them responsible for, you know, the cost of bringing these animals home. And I, I, obviously this doesn't necessarily include the contractor dogs, but the cost of bringing them home or the cost of getting them to their handler, their final destination doesn't seem like it's, it's like a little drop in the bucket, right? To what the, the military well, spending is. <laughs> and, and what we'd really like to see happen with both military and contract working dogs is vet care for life from their work their employers that work them to whatever point they were retired at. And it's, that's the right thing to do. There needs to be a, a Medicare basically for working a VA for working dogs. Whether yeah. They're contract, whether they're contract or not. I mean, we had a dog, uh, my dog, Oreo, military working dog that served in Iraq, over $20,000 to treat a very rare cancer. Uh, you know, I didn't have any help with that. It was out of pocket. And we can't pay bills for adopted dogs, so it's kind of on the adopter. And that's why we wish that the contractors in the military had some sort of stipend for military dog care and contract working dog care. Yeah, and it seems like that would be really easy to implement, Um, even with these contract dogs. 
if it were just part of the requirement of the contracts, it seems like it would be, you know, pretty easy to implement, but <laughs> um, getting people to do it, right? That's the, that's the, the hard part. It's a dance. It's a dance of the dollars. It, right. Exactly. Um, so I think that, you know, obviously Mission K9, I, I wouldn't have had you on the podcast if I, if it wasn't something that I was like, this is awesome and we need to tell more people about it. <laughs> um, because I, you know, it's not something that we are confronted with on a daily basis. Um, we don't often think about the working dogs. They just don't have the voice that even shelter dogs do, right? Like we're always seeing that how shelter dogs need our help and support and not often with our working dogs. And um, they're all, I don't want to say the same, but they are, I mean, the, obviously our working dogs are so incredible and do such, you know, wonderful, the work, the military dogs are so brave and do so many wonderful things that we have no idea <laughs> that they're even doing. But, um, to just put this out in front of people and say, guys, these, you know, these guys need, these dogs need help too. Um, I think is, is a really important thing to do. So uh, where can people learn more about helping about donating about possibly even adopting if they feel like they are a good yeah. fit. Let's talk about the learn more first. Uh, one of the best places they can see what's going on now is on our Facebook page. And that's just on Facebook under mission K nine. If they'd like to donate, they can go to our website, which is mission K nine rescue.org. And, uh, between the two, uh, lots of stuff uh, to read lots of information. And what is the, if somebody does think that they would be a good fit oh, okay. uh, and wanted to adopt one of these dogs, is that also through the website? Sorry, That's I, okay. sorry I glossed right over that one. But yes, when you're on the website, you'll see uh, up at the top menu, an adopt link. There is a full page that lists all the parameters and requirements related to adoption. And then our adoption application, which is powered by established uh, software. And from there, our coordinators will review the application and they will schedule interviews to those people that are a good fit for dogs in our care. It can be a quick adoption or it can take, you know, it can take months to find the right home for some dogs. So we ask that people that want to adopt that they be patient, especially if they have other dogs in their care. And is adoption available to anyone in the continental United States? Absolutely. Awesome. So I think we've talked about a lot <laughs> um, and given people a lot to think about that they might not have even known they needed to think about. Um, so I thank you, Bob, for joining us today and for telling everybody about Mission K-9 Rescue. And just so everybody knows, K-9 is the uh, letter K and the number nine when you're typing that in anywhere. And um, yeah, just thank you so much. I will make sure to include the links to your Facebook and your website in the show notes of the podcast. And is there any last words that you would like to, to send people off with? Just if you enjoy the things you have today, if you enjoy the security you have, thank a working dog. They're working at all our ports uh, trying to keep us safe from every kind of bad stuff that's out there. And thank you, Jessica. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode. Make sure that you're following the show so you never miss an episode. And please take a moment to rate the show on your podcast app. I'd also love it if you'd share this podcast with your friends and family so that they can benefit from the information to help their pets live long, happy lives too. Don't forget to take advantage of this special discount as a listener today and get access to over 100 online videos in my online dog training, The Furry Family Coach. Just go to thefurryfamilycoach.com and use code PODCAST at checkout to get your first month for only $7. That's thefurryfamilycoach.com and use code PODCAST at checkout to get your first month for only $7. I can't wait to have you join and see you on the inside. Oh, oh, oh.